to uh, come together and uh, in the hopes of breaking the bread of life and, uh, and uh, being invited by the Lord to sit at his table uh, to receive of all of the delicacies that he would have uh, for us to, uh, to eat. But truly, the Lord knows exactly what we need to have to thrive thereby and to survive and to, uh, you know, be nourished by with being the good shepherd that he is. He knows how to feed the sheep. And uh, it's just a wonderful thing to be found uh, in that number, to be considered, uh, praise the Lord, one of his sheep. Uh, truly, God is awesome. And we do thank him. Uh, amen for the opportunity that he has given us in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, before we go any further, uh, let us acknowledge the Lord uh, in prayer in Jesus' name. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, we love you and we do thank you. We're asking, Lord God, that you would have mercy upon us all, that you, Lord, would look upon us uh, with great favor. We're here for no other reason, Lord God, but to honor you, to uh, learn of you, and to receive of all the good that you have to bestow upon us. We're asking, Lord, that you would have mercy upon us all, that you would look upon every household represented here, uh, those that uh, are on their way, those that wanted to be here, couldn't be here, that you would bless us all with the things needful us, unto us in the desires of our heart, that you ultimately just bless the church. Lord, we're asking for your complete guidance. We're asking that you would have mercy upon us and you keep us from the enemy that we may be able to learn of you without distraction. Look upon us all, Lord, and have us to be able to walk away from here even more edified than we were before we got here. We look for your leadership to be led and guided by, guided by your spirit into all truth. We love and thank you immensely. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, giving honor unto the Lord who is the head of my life. Uh, praise the Lord unto uh, the uh, wonderful uh, and anointed uh, pastor of the house uh, in the person of uh, Elder John Betts. Uh, we do uh, uh, honor uh, his lovely wife, Lady Betts. Praise the Lord. Um, uh, Lady Laura, First Lady Loria Betts, as well as Mother Morell, we do honor. And on behalf of the uh, Central Jersey Bible Institute board, uh, we say praise the Lord unto you all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, this evening, praise the Lord, we will be uh, focusing on a topic entitled uh, The Flying Roll, uh, The Unseen Curse. Uh, the Flying Roll and the Unseen Curse. And this particular topic was coming from uh, the book of Zechariah, uh, chapter 5. And uh, just to help to set the table, uh, I'll read the word of God uh, to your hearing uh, as it is read in uh, Zechariah 5, verses 1 through 4. And the word of God reads on this wise. Then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a flying roll. Uh, and he said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits, and the breadth thereof 10 cubits. Then said he unto me, this is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For everyone that stealeth shall be cut off as on this side according to it. And everyone that sweareth shall be cut off as on that side according to it. I will bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of the thief and into the house of him that swear falsely by my name. And it shall remain in the midst of his house and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word that it may sanctify it deep in our hearts, that God truly may get the glory thereby in Jesus' name. Amen. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, uh, praise the Lord, as I was, um, uh, uh, as this, this uh, word was uh, coming to me as an inspiration, uh, praise the Lord, you, you, you just can't help but to align it with uh, the uh, the practicality of the world in that, you know, uh, many of the world, uh, the secular society, uh, you can't even just say that anymore, uh, praise the Lord. There's some within Christendom um, who have a very uh, different perspective of God. Um, from many people's vantage point, God is uh, um, uh, just so ultimately loving, which he is, but they're perspective of God as loving is skewed. Um, many people can't uh, seem to fathom the idea of God being a judge, uh, God uh, having a gavel, 
uh, by his side, so to speak. And, uh, you know, being in a position where he would use that gavel uh, if necessary. And, uh, and because they see God as being this, this ever big and beloved benevolent uh, being, uh, you know, who will never uh, uh, condemn evil because he is so uh, of the encompassing spirit of love that um, many people believe that they can pretty much do what they want to do. And when they face God in the end, God will just let them roll into heaven. Um, I, I'm sorry to say, but that spirit is very reminiscent of, uh, of the Egyptians, um, you know, who, uh, you know, would live their life and believe that, you know, once, uh, once they pass on, um, I believe it's Osiris would, uh, would, who, who was the gatekeeper to the netherworld, uh, would pretty much let them in because, you know, uh, in life, he was a good guy, and um, and as long as they could, uh, uh, you know, argue or rather say that he did well, you know, in my life I didn't do this, in my life I didn't do that, I wasn't a bad person, and all of these things that because he was such a good guy in life, uh, you know, this gatekeeper, um, he'll pretty much just let them go on by, and you know, God is kind of likened like that many regards I mean people see him in that regard you know that you know uh, he'll just let folks just pass on by because you know he's a good old guy and you know there can never be any type of um, uh, uh, spanking or judgment you know uh, condemnation uh, that could come from him but based on what we just read here in this uh, book of Zechariah uh, pertaining to uh, what we read in chapter five it's interesting because uh, this flying roll um, is seen coming from God. Um, it's seen coming down from, um, from heaven. Um, then I turned and lifted up my eyes and looked and behold, a flying roll and said, and what, he, what he said unto me, what seeth thou? And I answered, uh, I see a flying roll. And he goes on and describes how its, how its size is. Um, it is 20 cubits uh, in length which in inches is about 360 inches, which is in feet is about 30 feet. And uh, half of that is the breadth of it, the depth of it. So it's about 15 feet in depth. And, uh, and then it goes to say how this flying roll is sent as a curse. Um, when we read in Deuteronomy 28, uh, the Lord is speaking to Israel in regards to the blessing plan as well as the cursing plan. Um, this is the Lord speaking, and uh, he's always gone on record to say that, look, if you abide in me, um, then this, these blessings will come upon you. But if you choose not to abide in me, uh, then yes, these curses will come upon you. Uh, and because God is good, the Bible says, he is the epitome of good. Uh, God is love. Yes, he is the epitome of love. But if you don't walk with love and you don't walk in good, then the total opposite happens. You now are no longer under the umbrella of good. You now are no longer uh, within and under the roof of righteousness, of, you know, of love. And if you're not, then you're in the total opposite. Uh, you're in misery. Uh, you're in pain. Uh, you have now made your bed with evil. Um, and that's a concept that many people have a difficult time uh, wrapping their head around, have a difficult time trying to understand and see God from that vantage point. And they will argue you, argue with you tooth and nail, uh, you know, without any uh, source whatsoever, all on speculation, all on emotion, um, you know, without any type of uh, um uh, scriptures to support what they're talking about. This is just what they believe they know. Um, even though uh, no man has uh, uh, seen that which is uh, uh, bestowed upon uh, uh, upon man by God, uh, no man has seen it. No, it, it hasn't even gone into the mind of men, the things that God has set aside for them that love him. But yet these folks seem to have it within their mind, the knowledge to know that God won't do this to them. 
Um, but you have to stay in line with the scriptures because all we know is what the word tells us uh, because none of us has been up there to be able to come back and become a witness to the fact. Uh, and, and if you have been up there, um, you know, uh, that's a special privilege as what was uh, with Paul as well as with John. So this doesn't always happen. Get a glimpse of the glory of God and what he has in, he has in store for those that love him. Um, uh, so what we basically have is what word came down from up on high in this little book that was opened by the mighty angel. Uh, and the Lord came down and, and delivered this word unto us and told us to ingest it, to take it all in and to make it become one with our person. Uh, so to, if, if you are speculating that this is what it is in heaven, um, then you could seriously be doing yourself an injustice uh, knowing well off that we only have one life to live and that one life must be uh, led to the point where, uh, praise the Lord, it is in total uprightness before God, because we do know that the Lord is looking to and fro for the true worship. Even when we read in the Revelation accounts, it speaks about how Jesus, uh, praise the Lord, um, uh, performing in the role of the comforter, uh, amen, is saying, I have observed your works, and I can testify that it is either perfect or not perfect. When we, look, when we read in the seven letters of the churches, uh, he gave that pronunciation out there, that proclamation, rather, you know, that there were uh, five churches that he had a problem with, whose works were not perfect, yet the two churches that he did not have a problem with, but encouraged to continue on in Philadelphia and Smyrna, uh, praise the Lord, he did so. But we do see uh, the Lord sitting in the seat of judgment. And, you know, uh, even the Lord himself said of the Holy Ghost that he's going to come and to convince the world of uh, of evil, of righteousness, and even of sin. Uh, and so, you know, when Jesus is saying this to John on the Patmos, uh, praise the Lord, he is saying this under the authority that is that has been invested in him, uh, that the comforter is going to analyze what is righteous. The comforter is going to analyze what is uh, sinful and unrighteous. So, you know, when Jesus is saying these things, I have not found your works perfect. It goes to show that he's at work analyzing. He's at work looking, you know, and he is he is definitely fitting and standing in the shoes of the Lord, where as we do know the scriptures that his eyes are are looking to and fro on the earth for the true worshiper. So you have to worship him in spirit and in truth, and you cannot deviate from that, not one bit, not one iota. Because again, as we know in the revelations, he commands that uh, uh, if anybody takes away the words uh, from the book of the prophecy, he'll take away that person's name out of the book of life. And, and if anybody adds to it, you know, he's going to add unto them the plagues that are written in the book. So you're dealing with a God who is uh, um, um, is truly a judge. Yes, he's a loving God, but yes, he's still a judge. And what is he judging? He's judging to see if something is good or if something is bad. And if a person finds themselves aligning with the good, then well. But if a person finds themselves aligning with the bad, and that is a problem. But thanks be to God that he does give folks a space of repentance, a place, uh, praise the Lord, where they can come into some type of realization after the spirit of prophecy has been sent unto them. Because as the Bible says of the spirit of prophecy, it is sent out to make people ashamed. It is sent out to wake people up and to, to shake them out of their stupor, to make them to realize that they're either in line with God or they're out of line with God. And so, you know, it's supposed to make you ashamed if you're out of line with God. And that's what draws people back to repentance. So if somebody is out of line, then yes, the Lord will uh, allow the spirit of prophecy to speak unto them um, um, so that they can go back in line. Again, of the spirit of prophecy, Revelation speaks of that and says that the gospel of Jesus Christ, the words of Jesus Christ, is the spirit of prophecy. Therefore, the gospel itself will make you ashamed if you're in error. Um, and so that's what it's supposed to do. So the church goes out into the world to preach unto uh, the unbelievers, to make them ashamed, to make them realize that they need help. 
the same type of thing that you see, praise the Lord, in the book of Acts in the opening chapters in chapter two, when Peter spoke unto the, uh, into the diaspora of Israel who came to celebrate Pentecost. And after he spoke, there was 3,000 who, who, who became saved after that, men, men and brethren, what shall we do? And what, why are they asking that question? They're asking that question because after they heard the gospel, they became ashamed. After they heard the spirit of prophecy uh, come into them and, and do its work because Peter planted the seeds, having the keys of, of heaven, uh, praise the Lord. Uh, he planted the seeds into their heart and God brought the increase. Immediately began to work on them. A powerful and potent word went out. The spirit of prophecy went in and permeated their soul got into their mind and made them ashamed to the point where they knew they had to change this thing. And that's how it works. But yes, the Lord will uh, let a person know that they're either in the right or they're either in the wrong. Now, when uh, in order to bring this conviction, the Lord has to ha not have a problem with telling somebody that they are in the wrong. When we read in the Zechariah scripture pertaining to the flying roll, this flying roll has sent out flying down into households. It's going into everybody's household where it, where it has been commanded to go. And the command for the flying roll is to go into a sinner's household. And we're not just talking about uh, any type of sinner. There are two types of sinners that it's looking for. On one side of the roll, uh, the scriptures say that he's looking uh, for the thieves. And on the other side of the road, he's looking for those who swear against the Lord. And so, uh, praise the Lord. Now, you may say, well, hey, you know, I'm not a thief. So I guess that the role's never going to come into my house. I've never stolen anything. And then another person may say, well, hey, look, I've never sworn against God. You know, I guess he's never going to come into my house. I don't have to worry about that. But we do know that the scriptures cannot lie. And it has definitively said that all man has sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody has sinned. I don't care who you are. Anyone that is born under the face of the sun has sinned. The Lord has declared that. His eyes have gone to and fro on the earth and has declared that there is none righteous, no, not one. Therefore, that role, regardless of what how you define it, is coming into your house and has been in your house. So uh, once it comes into the house, it begins to corrupt the house because the house was already corrupt to begin with. All this did was validate the corruption. And it not only just comes in and sits there, no, it comes in and like cancer begins to spread uh, based off of the sin that 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 it's validating that it sees there. I see the sin, I see that it's there. And this little note that's been floating into your person, into your house is, is condemning you, you know? And so what it does, it gets into the cedar of the house. It gets into the nuances of the house. It gets within the stones and the cracks and the crevices of the house. It encapsulates the entire embodiment of the house. Uh, it, it poisons the house. And so you may think that, my goodness, I'm okay. Oh, no, yeah, everything seems all right. You don't see that this thing is, this invisible thing is really taking over your person. You have been condemned and you are on your way to die if this thing stays there. But then you may argue and say, but look, I am not a thief. The role says that on one side of it, uh, you know, I'm condemned if I'm a thief but I've never stolen anything. And on the other side of the role, it says that if I swore against God falsely, then I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a sinner. I've done none of those things. Why is this thing here? Why has this thing been sitting in my person declaring that I am a sinner? Well, we know the Bible can't lie. All men have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But again, your definition of what thievery uh, uh, is in error. You're not seeing thievery the way God sees thievery, uh, praise the Lord, because we do know that the nature of Satan is what? To steal, kill, and to destroy. 
just as the Bible says that tribulation works patience, patience works experience, and experience works hope, and hope maketh not a shame, praise the Lord. It all starts from tribulation. Tribulation is the spark that kicks off the entire chain of events. Tribulation to patience, to experience, to hope, to faith, to righteousness, first started because of suffering. First started because you went through a trial. And then once you went through the trial, God saw your wherewithal. God saw your resolve. And once he saw that resolve, praise the Lord, then he declared like he did, praise the Lord, for uh, Abraham, that uh, I, now I've seen that you believe in God. Now I know you believe in God. Stay your hand, Abraham. Don't touch the lad. Don't slay the boy. I just needed to see, praise the Lord, if through your tribulation, you will be righteous at the end. And yes, you have done so. So because we've seen this pattern, this precedence that has been established by God, that these things are linearly laid out, um, consecutively laid out, praise the Lord. It starts here and it ends here. Therefore, if we take that same precedence and apply it to uh, thievery, we look at the father of sin, praise the Lord, as declared by Jesus Christ when he spoke to the Pharisees that you do the deeds of your father. So that would therefore mean that all of the children of sin do the deeds of the father of sin, which is Satan. And what are the deeds of the father of sin? He comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. And so if we look at that in a flat linear line, he comes to steal, from stealing, he comes to kill, and from killing, he comes to destroy. That's what he does, praise the Lord. And therefore, you are a thief. Why? Because what you did was you were, first of all, a father, uh, uh, the child of the devil. And the nature of the child of the devil uh, is to do as the father of, of, of that children does, which is Satan, which is to steal, kill, and to destroy. Therefore, whatever you did that's considered evil falls under the umbrella of being a thief. You stole something from somebody. Uh, you, you, you coveted something from somebody. You hurt somebody. You stole their, their joy. You, 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 you brought pain unto them. Whatever it is, it would fall under that umbrella, umbrella of being a thief. You stole. You took something that wasn't yours. It did not belong to you. You hurt your neighbor is what you did. You did not honor the second of the greatest commandments, which is to love thy neighbor as thyself. No, you did not. When you steal, you're not stealing from yourself. You're stealing from somebody else. You took something that did not belong to you. Therefore, you trespassed against your neighbor. And so every last one of us that has been born under the sun falls under that umbrella. Have you ever, this is the question that we need to ask ourselves, have we ever trespassed against our neighbor? And once we can say yes, then yes, bam, open up the front door because here comes the flying roll and it's ready to condemn us. It has condemned us. It has now declared and put our name on that roll, on that side of the roll, praise the Lord, that says yes, because they trespassed against their neighbor, they have sinned and that sin will remain. And that sin doesn't just sit there because some folks are okay with just having a little sin there. Oh, it's okay to lie. Oh, it's okay to steal. Oh, it's okay to hurt somebody. They're okay with that. They don't think that nothing is happening. They don't see what's going on spiritually, that that role is in their house. Praise the Lord. And I'm not talking about the physical house. I'm talking about the bodily house. This thing is bringing you to death. It gets into the cedars of your person, of your body. It gets into the sinews of your person. It poisons your blood. It gets all up in the organs of who you are. It rots out your inside. It corrupts the inside and works its way outside. If Jesus says a person is clean first from the inside out, then truly, if you just look at it on the opposite side, a person is not just dirty on the outside. He has to start on the inside. 
Everything starts on the inside and works its way outside. If you're going to be evil, that evil starts on the inside and works its way outward. If you're going to be clean, that cleanliness must happen on the inside and then work its way outside. First make clean the inside of the cup and then the outside will be clean. Oh yes, it will. Praise the Lord, it will. And so this thing, they think that it's not there. They just don't see it. And they think that they're okay because they've been deceived that God is so loving that he would never send such a role in my house. And because they haven't educated themselves, they haven't put themselves in a position to listen to the voice of God. They have not taken heed to the invitation to come and sit at his dinner table and dine with him. They've ignored the invitation. God's anger is not turned away, it says in Isaiah, but his hand is stretched out still. Praise the Lord. They have not regarded the stretched out hand of God, praise the Lord, because if they did, they would have then understood what thievery meant, that knowledge, that lack of knowledge is bringing them to destruction because they refuse to educate themselves. They refuse to learn something. They listen to their own inward thoughts, praise the Lord. They, 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 let, they, they hung their hat on speculation, and they were content with that. As long as my desires are met, I don't care because I don't feel any different. I wake up every day and I feel the exact same way. My goodness, even though you say I'm in my sin, I still lay my head down to sleep. And when I wake up, I feel just as good. What are you talking about up in here? You can't go by your feelings, praise the Lord. You're feeling good, but yet you're dying on the inside. You better wake yourself up. It's almost as if, Praise the Lord, the leprosy has taken over your entire person and you can no longer feel your the nervous system working. You can't feel the pain no more. And just because you don't feel the pain, you think you're okay. And if you don't feel the pain, that means that spiritually speaking, you have become death toned to the gospel of Jesus Christ because the gospel of Jesus Christ is supposed to bring you to some pain. Oh yes, it is. Let me explain. As I said earlier, praise the Lord. It is supposed to bring you to an ashamedness. It is supposed to bring you to a, a state of repentance. You're supposed to feel pain. Remember what happened, praise the Lord, when the apostle Peter, after he denied Jesus three times, and he came to the revelation that my goodness, what Jesus said was true, I did this. And he felt such regret and sorrow. And it got to the point, praise the Lord, that he remembered what the Lord said. He said to him after he, when he first prophesied, he said, Peter, this is what you're going to do to me. But after you have regained yourself, you go strengthen your brethren. So Peter at the very least knew that at some point in time, he was going to move from the sorrow and he was going to move into a place of repentance where he would never do that thing no more. He would turn away from that. He would never deny Jesus no more. Praise the Lord. But that was where he once was. Amen up in here. And if you can get to the place where you listen to Jesus Christ and allow his gospel to speak unto you, it's going to bring you to a place of sorrow, just like it did with Peter. And what happened at the end? At the end, a good thing happened. Peter gained life. Peter knew, my goodness, I better not touch that no more. Peter has his nervous system that if he touches the fire, he's going to burn. That if he touches this, oh, I'm going to burn. And I don't like the feeling like that no more. That's why the Bible speaks that you cannot spare the rod when you are dealing with a child. Why? Because if you don't do, if you don't chastise them, they're going to learn that they're going to continue in their evil ways. Praise the Lord. The way that, that they, uh, that the chastisement was to, was to correct them with, they're going to continue in those ways. And the Bible goes as far as to say that they can end up in hell. You got to correct them. This is what the gospel, the gospel is a course correcting word. It hurts because you may want to keep going in that direction. But it don't have to hurt if you're willing to comply and to bend to the move of the spirit. Once you allow the gospel to speak, oh, here comes the sorrow. Here comes the cleanse. 
Here comes the regrets. Now my eyes are open. The scales have, have fallen down for my eyes and I can see. The Lord allows you to see. See what? You see as he sees, not as man sees no more. Now you're starting to understand something. Now you're starting to get some wisdom. Praise the Lord. Now I got knowledge. Knowledge is what goes up inside of you first. Wisdom, rather praise the Lord. Knowledge goes inside of you first. You have to understand what that knowledge is. Wisdom shows you how to apply the knowledge. So before you can fear God, or rather when you fear God, the Bible says that's the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is knowledge. Understanding what that is, is the understanding of the knowledge. Applying it is the wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Because when I apply fear of the Lord, to life, then I'm not gonna just step in anybody's direction. Then I, I'm not gonna just follow anybody's counsel. I'm not gonna say yay to every person uh, who, 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 who tries to coerce me to say yay. I'm not gonna say nay to the things of God. Why? Because the fear of the Lord is wisdom. I'm applying the fear of the Lord knowledge to life. That's wisdom. So that's what the gospel gives you. It gives you that knowledge, shows you, and it shows you how to apply it. It's so important. You got to know how to apply it. So if you don't want that role to come into your house, somehow, some way, you got to stop being a thief. How can you just extract it once it has now become a part of your person? Because the scriptures say it gets within the sinews of the house. It, it works its way within the fiber of the house. It becomes one with the house. That curse becomes one with the house. So everybody who's outside of Jesus Christ is under a curse that they cannot physically extract. You can't pull it out because to pull it out is to pull yourself out. Jesus said that, look, if your hand offends you, you cut it off. You see, because when the sin gets up in there, it makes itself one with it. It's better that you cut it off. If it was all up in your eyes, it's better that you pluck it out. It works its way within the fiber of your person until it becomes your identity. You have now merged with sin. You have now become an embodiment of sin. It is your body. It is your house. It is who you are. And it not just, it's, it's so uh, insidious that it doesn't just mess with your natural because we're composed of three elements, body, soul, and spirit. That sin sees the body, I gotcha. And I'm going to destroy it. I'm going to become one with it. I'm married to you. You are now a sinner. But then, he sees something else in there. He sees a soul. Oh, I'm getting up in that too. And so he begins to wrap himself up in your soul until all you do is think sin. That's your character. And God looks at the soul of a person. He looks past the outside and he looks into the innards of who we are. And what he sees is, is our character. Are you a godly person or are you a sinful person? That role, that curse, if it gets wrapped up into your soul, will define you in the sight of God as being a sinful person. But then it doesn't stop there. He sees your spirit, the true essence of who you are, the life force within this body, this shell, this, this bodily temple who is supposed to serve as a royal priesthood for God on the inside. But God's not in a sinner, praise the Lord. No, he's not, he's not in that temple. That temple is a den of thieves. The perfect words that Jesus used, this points back to this Zechariah scripture because of the, the, the flying role on the one side designates sinners as thieves. It became a den of thieves. Once that flying roll gets up in there and he declares you a thief, 
He declaring you a child of the devil, a thief, a murderer. He steals. He kills. And he doesn't stop there because he's bloodlusting. He murders. He destroys what he's hoping for. He can't physically do it. He can't even spiritually destroy you. That, that power is in God's hands. But what he'll do is he'll try to put you in a position to where God has to bring the gavel down upon your person. That's why he's known as the accuser of the brethren. So my goodness, I'm a thief. Why? Because I am a child of the enemy, the devil. That's what happens when this, this role gets into that person. But then the Bible gets deeper and speaks. They say, wait a minute. That's just one side of the role. There's another side. You got to turn it over. And on the other side of the role, it speaks about those who swear falsely against God. So wait a minute. How could that apply? I don't, I don't go about swearing falsely against God. I don't do those things. No, I don't. I, I don't. I don't go out there and, and say God said this and God said, and there's no validation. That may be all well and true. And for that person, yes, that may be true. But you know what? If you really look at what this role represents, it, it covers the basis of all sin. Because everybody has sin and everybody has stolen. So for sure, everybody's a thief because we, we, we stole from our neighbor. And when you look at the other side, now you're looking at those who are the religious of life. You're looking at those who are like the Pharisees that Jesus combated spoke against and had issues with. And they would call him blast. He would say he was, a, he was blaspheming and they would call him bells above and they would say all of these horrible things about Jesus, insulting things about Jesus. Put the, they put him on the cross for goodness sakes. They said all of these harmful things, these things that would lead people astray, praise the Lord. Uh, these things that are not uh, 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 God sanctioned, but man sanctioned. But yet, for some reason, they get caught up in the in the whole uh, idea of the of being religious, and they like people uh, honoring them and worshiping them and giving them gifts and money and all of these things. That it becomes an insult to God. He even speaks to the Nicolaitans, and he says, "Look, this is the thing I hate." When you have those who are in a position of leadership, a religious leadership, who have now put their leadership in the authority and taken using it as the authority over the laity, where they have now taken God's glory unto themselves and made them lords over God's heritage. And then you have those who are just out there who, uh, who, who, who call on supposedly the name of the Lord but they still have their, their sinister ways and they're trying to coerce people to follow them in the name of the Lord. Oh yeah, the Lord has a problem when you take his name and use it falsely. The Lord has an issue, praise the Lord, with anybody who, who, who tramples upon his name. For even God honors his name, praise the Lord. God honors his word, Jesus Christ, is his name, Lord Jesus Christ. He is the word and the Bible honors his word. And when you don't honor his word, then you better, you might as well open up the window. You might as well raise the roof open, praise the Lord, because here comes the flying scroll. It's coming into your house, praise the Lord. And it's declaring, I have heard enough. And now I declare before the most high that you are one who has now been cursed because you have sworn in the name of the Lord falsely. Oh, you better watch what you say in Jesus' name. You better know what you're talking about if you want to keep that flying scroll from coming into your house. You better watch what you say. You better sit in somebody's Sunday school, someone reputable, and you better learn a thing or two. Oh, yes, you better. Because if you start saying things wrong and you can't back it up, 
praise the Lord, then here comes the flying scroll. And that flying scroll, once he gets up in there, he's not leaving, praise the Lord. It takes one thing that can get that flying scroll out. And if you don't have that one thing, then you might as well make room for daddy, praise the Lord, because he's moving on up in here and he's going to make himself one with you. Cursed. How can that person think at the living their life with this flying roll all up in their person, encapsulating their entire being, not just in their bodily temple, but now in their spirit and in their soul. The Bible says and speaks about, praise the Lord, that God does see the soul. Yes, he does, praise the Lord. Adam was laying on the ground as dust, praise the Lord, formulated his body from dust, but he had no life into him until Jesus, until the Lord breathed through his nostrils and he became a living soul. Then this man could stand up and have a conversation with God. God was speaking to the living soul, amen. But if a person lives their life and then they die, after having lived with this flying roll throughout the entirety of their life, God is surely going to see that person's soul. And he's not going to see him alone. He's going to see that he's holding his hands with that flying roll. And that flying roll, he don't care. He's going to go, even though he lived with that person and slept with that person and ate with that person, he had no problem with throwing that person under the bus and declaring to God that this one right here that I lived with for all this time is a curse. And the Lord may say, well, why are they a curse? Because they swore falsely against you. Because they stole, they was not honorable to your second of the greatest commandments. And because they fought, they swore falsely to you, they did not honor the first of the greatest. They broke every commandment. That's why I'm here, says the flying roll. That's why this is a curse, this person up in here. I know I'm a curse. I know I have the authority to, to sanction who's a curse. And I'm telling you that that one right there that I've been having dinner with every night of their lives, I'm telling you they're no good. I don't want that type of friend. I don't want that type of individual within me. I don't want somebody pointing the finger, praise the Lord, at me. And he's walking with me and he's talking with me. Something has got to change up in here. I can't live like that. Thanks be to God. Praise the Lord. After he has declared all men has sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Lord could have easily said, okay, that's enough. They're all guilty. Let me just do away with the mess of them. The lot of them, they deserve to die. Did not Jesus say that to his own brethren according to the flesh? He said, your time is always ready. My time is not yet ready, praise the Lord. It ain't my time to die, but it's always your time to die. Well, what can you, why do you say that? Because you're a sinner and you're only here Praise the Lord, because you're dealing with a loving God, a God whose character is that he is not willing to see anybody perish, but that all should come unto repentance and be saved. Oh, yes, this is who you're dealing with. This is a loving God who draws folks with loving kindness. This is what he does. Praise the Lord. Thanks be to God that that's his character. When you look at the soul of God, you see love. We're not talking about the love that you see from man to man. No, that's not real love. Praise the Lord. In fact, they can't even define that love properly. They think, praise the Lord, that loving means accepting anybody's nature, accepting anybody's sins and, and filth. And no, that's not love because God is love and he doesn't just accept sin. The Bible says in Isaiah, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. His anger is not turned away because he still has issue with your sins. He still has issues with your bad habits. He still has issues with your problems, but my goodness, he still has his hand stretched out still that if all we need to do is to reach out ourselves, 
You see, we got to do our part and reach our hand out to grab his hand. He's already done his part by putting his hand out. He extended his hand. And just like you can't lead a horse, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink it. He's not going to make you reach your hand out to grab his hands. You got to get it up in your head that it's worth reaching your hand out to hold on to the Lord's hand. He's not going to just hold your hand and smile at you. He's going to hold your hand, place you on the potter's wheel, break you apart, praise the Lord up in here, restop you, pull out the gunk, pull out all of the, 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 the chud and everything that shouldn't be there. And then he's going to sop you up with water, soften you up, refashion you, and then put you in the oven, take you out, decorate you, paint you, make you look beautiful until he can use you as a vessel of honor. That's what happens when you grab his hand. That's that outstretched hand of the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's what happened the Lord. I grab your hand. I see I have a problem up in here. I got this thing that's inside of me, this flying roll that has come into my person for so many years. It's been here and he's quiet. He doesn't talk to me. Praise. He doesn't say that. All I can see is myself becoming darker. I can see myself becoming frailer. I see myself falling apart as if I'm a leaf that has fallen from the tree and I'm beginning to wither. In the beginning, when I was young and strong, I still looked vibrant even though I was laying down on the ground. And why is that possible? Because I still had the residue of the sap that was in the true vine, according to John chapter 15, the true vine. But because I didn't abide in the tree, I fell to the ground. Oh yeah, I didn't turn brown right away. It took time. And the reason why I'm turning brown now is because the flying roll is corrupting my person like leprosy. I don't even feel it, praise the Lord. I didn't know I was doing evil because that's what leprosy will do to you, praise the Lord. And that's what the flying roll is doing to you. It is taking away your nerve, your nervous system. You can't tell that you're doing right or wrong anymore. But you see the word of God, once he came down into darkness, truly was a light that would give me some type of sensation that even though my nervous system has been fused and and it no longer works and it's, it doesn't go into my into my 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 organs and vessels to the point I can't feel pain anymore praise the lord I can't feel a sensation anymore yet the word is so strong praise the lord that even if you don't have a means to feel somehow some way these dry bones praise the Lord, will feel something. They will hear the word. And all of a sudden, the dry bones will begin to have sinews and it will begin to get moist. And, and all of a sudden, these dry bones, which were once clinking and clanking, now it's starting to look like a person all over again. That's what the word does. It has the power, praise the Lord, to go in and surgically repair the nervous system that was once, praise the Lord, made destitute by the flying rolls curse, praise the Lord. It will give you the power to feel again. My goodness, that when that word comes unto you, now you know there's something about that man right there. I've never heard a man speak like him. There's something about once Jesus opens up his mouth, the power of God begins to speak and devils begin to scatter. They know they're in trouble. Once the Lord opens up his mouth and begins to just utter a diction that you have never heard before, and you, all you can do is testify that it was like fire. It got up inside of me, and it was like fire on the inside. I felt different when I heard this man speak. I was dead before. I was dying. I was a bruised reed about to break off. I was smoking flax about to be quenched. There was nothing in me. I was on my last breath, but the word of God came up in me and like a light shining into darkness, all of a sudden resuscitated me. He was like a defibrillator upon my heart and began to pump it and pump it and pump it and push it and gave me the strength, praise the Lord, to move not just my old dirty blood. He gave me a blood transfusion. Oh my goodness, he resupplied me with red blood cells. 
that carried a new oxygen, a new breath. It's called the breath of life. It came from God. And that red blood cell just went through my person after Jesus defibrillated my heart, gave it the strength of a young man. Praise the Lord up in here. And then now all of a sudden that blood is pushing the breath of God through my entire bodily person. And now I'm starting to breathe again. And then the white blood cells, oh, my white blood cells used to be defenseless. My white blood cells was a joke at some time, at one time. But once Jesus came and spoke to me, oh, that blood transfusion gave me a new set of white blood cells. Oh, now it's fighting everything inside of me. My goodness, it's as if I got a troop inside of me, just fighting everything, every disease thing that I allowed to come into the house. Because once you let that devil in, he don't come by himself. He'll bring seven other worse than himself. He'll build up the whole body full of a legion of demons if possible. If you keep your door, front door open, Oh, and you'll become a curse every day, a curse upon a curse upon a curse. But Jesus' words are so powerful that his one word can tell the 2,000 demons, get thee yonder and go and abide within the flock of pigs across the way. Oh, yes, he will. That's how powerful the word of God is. Powerful, my goodness. It just, is, it just commands change. Paul said to himself when he was in prison in Philippi, he said, there's some folks over here who are mocking me and they're joking and they're teasing the gospel. They're joking Christ and all of this. But then there's some faithful folks over here who know I'm in here for the cause of Jesus Christ. And Paul said, nevertheless, Jesus is being preached. Why? Praise the Lord, because that word Jesus commands power commands change. There's no other name under heaven whereby a man can be saved. That once you start saying Jesus on the inside, because you understand who he is, now your soul is being changed. Why? Because the soul is your character. That right there is your identity of whether you're a good person or a bad person. My body doesn't determine that. My spirit doesn't determine that, but my soul determines that. And once my soul understands who this man Jesus is, oh, now change starts to happen. Praise the Lord. It's almost as if somebody's saying Jesus is on, Jesus, Jesus on the inside of me. And praise the Lord, because somebody's saying Jesus, Jesus on the inside of me, them devils have got to flee to all of their shenanigans and all of the mess and everything that associated me with being a child of the devil starts to move away. Praise the Lord because Jesus is making a change inside of me. Praise the Lord. Oh, yes, he is. I'm reflective of when the Lord was dealing with Israel in the Exodus and how the Lord told Moses, Moses, for this last plague, I want you to take a lamb, unspotted lamb, and I want you to slay that lamb. Lord, why do I got to just do what I'm telling you to do? I'm telling you, I'm giving you a word from up on high. This has been sanctioned in heaven. There's a record that bears witness of what I'm talking about in the Father, the Son, and the Holy. They understand and they are in total agreement with what I'm talking to you about. You don't understand this because you wasn't at the gates of heaven. You wasn't in the chambers of heaven when this was discussed. You wasn't in our war chambers when we decided how we were going to save humanity from the grips of Satan and his he evil henchmen. You wasn't within the gates of heaven, but I am. And I'm telling you that this is what we have devised. Lord, I'm just going to do what you said. And you said, I got to take a lamb, an unspotted lamb. Okay, I'll be very understanding of that. I'll, I, I don't have the wherewithal yet, but I know, praise the Lord, that whatever you say, it's got to be right. I want you to take that lamb, Moses, and slay that lamb. I want you to put your family in a house, your house. I want you to, before you go into that house, and before, praise the Lord, you sit down and eat, 
I want you to take the blood from that ram and I want you to put it on the lintels of the doorpost. I want you to put it around the doorpost. I need for you to do that. It is very important. You, you cannot omit this, Moses. Okay, Lord, I'll do that. I'll, I will do that. So that's exactly what Moses did. And he told all of the other children of Israel to do that. Why? Because he was his brother's keeper. You see, he was honoring the second of the greatest commandments. Love your neighbor as yourself. I'm not going to keep this thing within me. I'm going to share the wealth. Praise the Lord. That's why when a preacher gets a word, praise the Lord, they're not supposed to just hold it on the inside. They've got to share the wealth. They've got to tell people because they got to get saved too. And because, be, because maybe the Lord wants to use you as a conduit, as the person who grabs the fish and the, and the loaves of bread to, to, to feed the masters. He has compassion for the people because they're hungry and they're, a bunch of, they're like a bunch of sheep just scattered across the land. So the Lord is going to use this preacher. Here, take this food and you give it to my people. Praise the Lord. And that's what Moses did. He did exactly that. He told the Israelites. And so what they did was they followed the Lord's instruction. And as we do know, the death angel came around and he looked, he looked and he could tell who honored God by the blood that was on the door. And on the inside, they were eating the lamb. They're becoming one with the lamb. They were having the communion feast with the lamb. They were honoring the death, burial, and the resurrection of the lamb. They was having a communication of sorts, very reminiscent, praise the Lord, of what you see uh, in the image of the kingdom of God. When the Lord told uh, Peter, James, and John to follow him up, what we know as the Mount of Transfiguration, and once he got up there, his body was transfigured figured and illuminated like a light bulb, praise the Lord. And on his left and his right side was Moses and Elijah, but they were doing something very distinctive. They were talking to Jesus about what he had to do, his death, burial, and resurrection. So therefore, the kingdom of God is continually talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when you go into Moses's home, you see the family eating the communion, praise the Lord. In other words, spiritually speaking, having a conversation about the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. These were the kingdom of God having dinner with, praise the Lord, the communion dinner of Jesus Christ in the house. And so, praise the Lord, we can see from that illustration, there's only one thing that's going to get that flying roll out of your house, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. That's it. There's only one thing. The reason why Moses had to do this because he had the flying roll in his house. Because all man has sinned and come short of the glory of God. The death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus is the purging of that flying roll from a person's house. It eradicates all of the, the filth that was associated with having the flying roll in the house. It not only corrupted Moses, but it, it, it has the potential of stretching itself outwardly and corrupting other people. That's why I have an issue with those who say that I can live my life any way I want. What I do in my home is my business. Yeah, I understand that. But when you say, when you, when you basically are saying that I'll do what I want, even if it means sinning against God and it has nothing to do with you. And what I do in my home if I decide to sin against God in my home, that has nothing to do. It won't touch you. That's a lie. It will touch you. That's like saying Satan could be in the earth and not mess with nobody. That's like saying cancer can be in your body and it's just going to stay in one place. Oh, no, that's not how it works. No, that's like saying a person could be in a building where there's a fire and the fire is only going to stay in one room and not touch the rest of the house. That's wrong. It doesn't work that way. Sin does not stay in one place. Sin stretches itself outward. We have already read, according to Zechariah, the fifth chapter, that that flying roll is going to make its way through the innards of the house. 
is going to get in the cracks and the crevices of the house. The Bible even goes further to talk about that. Look, you cast out the scorner. If you cast out the scorner, the strife will cease. You cast out the angry person, the strife will cease. So if you have an angry person in the world, he is going to gender much more anger. He is going to spread his anger. He cannot just sit in a place of isolation and just be angry. No, he's going to corrupt others around him because that's what they do. If you're an angry person, then let's get deep about this. Then you're a lustful person. Why? Because now you're going against the uh, these, these scriptures itself. I'm not just talking about being angry and not sinning. The Lord gives us permission, be angry, but don't sin. Once you are angry and now you sin, Oh, yeah. now you have encroached upon your neighbor and you have encroached upon the Lord. Now you have encroached upon the two great commandments, because if you break any one of those, now you are a sinner. That's what makes you a sinner, because you have, uh, you know, not uh, loved your neighbor as yourself, which is the second of the greatest commandments. And you have not loved the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength, which is the first of the great commandments. Of the, So there's two. So if you're angry. And you sin is because you that sin that defines you as being a sinner is because you broke either one, two, or both of the commandments. So once a person who is angry, you can be angry, but you better still love your brother. You can be angry, oh, but you better still love God. Once you sin, then you broke one of the two of those commandments or both. Now you have a problem. Now your anger is spilling out unto God. Now your anger is spilling out unto man. It's not staying in one place. It spreads out. So I, all those folks that speak about, oh, I can live this life and this behavior uh, and it has nothing to do with you when you, we already know that you have encroached upon God. You have already broken uh, the first commandment which is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength, because God said, don't do it. And you say it's okay to do. What's to stop you from spreading that wisdom elsewhere? That false wisdom, that wisdom that comes from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that, that other wisdom, that wisdom of man. You see the wisdom of God or wisdom of man, that wisdom of man. It doesn't just sit in one place. Look at what happens when the wisdom of man has his way. Look how corrupt the earth is. Look what happened and what prompted the Lord to bring a flood. It's because the wisdom of man brought it to that place. And it's going to happen again because the Lord said at the end, it's going to be just as, less, we can probably declare that it will be worse than the times of Noah. Worse. You literally going to have hell on earth. And it's not because folks are being sinful in their home only. No, it's because that sin has made its way outward. It's, it's, it's bloodthirsty. Is what it is. He wants to see everybody look like itself. It just spreads death. And, and that's a problem. So the only way to get that flying roll out is by the blood of Jesus Christ. That right there is the solvent that will scrub the sins off the walls of who you are. That right there is the cleanser. It's the bleach. Praise the Lord. That will make your soul clean. First, make clean the inside of the cup. And then the outside is going to be clean. That right there extracts the flying roll from your person, the work of Jesus Christ. That right there is what does it. And my goodness, in order to get it, it took death to bring it. Because in order to have blood, someone had to die. In order to have that blood, somebody special had to die. This ain't just anybody's blood. We've already declared that. My goodness, once his blood comes into you, once this blood transfusion comes into you, that's why he said, take drink, all of it. You need a blood transfusion. Once that blood of Christ comes in, that pure heavenly blood, oh, it's going to make clean the inside of the cup. And it will give you the defenses, praise the Lord. It will give you the defenses to ward off the plagues of the world. Yes, it will because of the white blood cells that are associated with the blood of Christ. 
You can take any deadly thing, he said. It won't hurt you if it's God's will. It ain't hurting you. And then it has the way, it has a, the wherewithal to, 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 to resuscitate your person and, and the breath of God as the red blood cells carry the oxygen of God, the breath of God through your entire being. Yes, this right here, this blood that, I, that you just don't buy in a store, praise the Lord, it had to come from a person because blood belongs in a person, praise the Lord. That meant that it had to be spilled. And that mean that there had to be someone special who occupied it, or rather it, it was uh, that it was housed with. And now that person has now been opened up to allow that blood to come out. Who is that person? That person is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Couldn't be just any man. Had to be a special one. Had to be one where the father declared, praise the Lord, that this is my beloved son and whom I, he's different. He's special. This right here, this is special. And you better treat him like he's special. Oh, yes. But we know the stone which the builders have rejected had become the head of the corner. He didn't look like much, but he was much. He didn't seem like he had it going on. Oh, but he has everything going on. But every knee shall bow unto him. Every tongue will confess that, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. It takes his blood to get that flying roll out of your house. And if it takes that blood to clean your house, then you are no longer accursed. It has been surgically extracted from your person. The devil don't want folks to understand that. Why? Because he's still about his destroying mantra. I got to just have them destroyed. I got to keep them as being a den of thieves. Got to keep that. He wants to roll the stay. Because if the roll stays, then he can destroy. Then he, then he can see destruction for that person. That curse inside of that person, it, it, it invites their destruction. It is inevitable. They will be destroyed because that curse is inside of them. Folks have got to wake up. They've got to wake up and realize that they are on a fast track to hell. That curse is going to witness against them in that day, is going to speak up and say, yes, they are a curse. The only reason I'm here, I wouldn't be here if they didn't, if they didn't deserve me to, uh, if, if they didn't deserve to have me here they were cursed oh yes they are and the lord is doing everything he can to invite us into his hospital to have us surgically remove this curse and the only way you can do it he's made it so easy for us i just want you to believe i've made your work easy i want you to believe he said the work of god is this that you believe on the son in whom he have sent. That's all it takes. And it's not just believing in his person. Oh, I believe Jesus existed. Yeah, the devils believe as well. That we, we, we know that the belief that, that God requires has to go beyond what the devils have. The devils believe, okay? That means my belief has to eclipse what the devil's definition of belief is. It has to eclipse it, praise the Lord. That means that my belief cannot just be that, oh, I believe he's a good person. You see, a lot of folks in the world think that. That's all they think. Oh, Jesus is a wonderful teacher. Oh, he's a good person. Oh, he's a holy man. Okay, yeah, they're stuck at the same plateau of where the devils are because the devils know that he's a good person. The devil knows that God is good. He knows that. He hates it, but he also knows it. God is good. Can't shake that, you know? He tried to beat it, can't win. He knows his time is short. All the demons know that time is short. That when they saw Jesus walking up the street, they begged pretty much. Hey, no, it's not the time, is it? Is it time for me to go? They feared because they knew that once they saw him, he might have been sent there as the word to declare, it's time for you to go to hell. Time for you to be cast into the lake of fire. That's it. He knows that. When you see Jesus, you see the enforcer. You see him. Oh, yes. And so if the devils believe, 
then our belief has to be better than theirs. It has to go further than theirs. They believe Jesus is the enforcer. Even then, Zechariah even speaks of that even further. When he speaks about, uh, praise the Lord, in, um, in Zechariah chapter 1, it speaks about the red horse rider. And then the red and white speckled horses behind the rider. And the red horse rider is in amongst the myrtle trees. And he's sitting on this red horse among the trees which are green and at times can be shrubbery, at times can grow up into 100 feet tall. But in this instance, these are more like bushes that it's among. They have a very distinctive look to it. They're beautiful, these myrtle trees. They have white flowers, interesting flowers, and they have an aroma and a smell like a perfume. And this red horse rider was amongst them. And behind him was speckled red and white horses, which were sent into the earth. And then they came back with the report, these red and white speckled horses and they said that the earth is still the writer takes that information and speaks to the father and asks how long is it going to be before you cast judgment on those who are at rest this was during a time when uh praise the lord uh you know the gentile nations had the rule and and the Gentile nations oppressed Israel. Uh, Israel fell under Babylon. And they're now this, they're at rest. They're comfortable where they are with Israel underfoot. And this angers the Lord. But this red horse rider, I'm going to read it to you really quick. I saw by night and behold a man riding upon a horse and he stood among the myrtle trees uh, that, there, uh, that were in the bottom. And behind him were their red horses speckled and white. Then I said, oh, Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, these are they whom the Lord sent to walk to and fro in the earth. And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees. He was an angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees. OK, that's 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 significant. He stood among the myrtle trees and said, we have walked to and fro through the earth and behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord, how long uh, wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which thou has had indignation these three score and 10 years? Speaking of Israel, uh, praise the Lord, when Judah was, was sent captive into Babylon for 70 years. And the Lord answered the angel, that talk with me with good words and comfortable words. This was the mediator between God and man. This was an angel of the Lord. An angel is a ministering spirit sent forth to minister unto them who shall be heirs of salvation as per Hebrews chapter one. Jesus Christ came as a ministering spirit sent forth to minister unto them who shall be heirs of salvation. He came as an angel of the Lord. He was literally uh, the Lord as uh, performing the work of an, uh, an angel, a ministering spirit. Did not Jesus say, look, I did not come to be ministered, but I came to minister. He came in the, in, the, in the office of an angel. And so here we see this illustration depicts the angel of the Lord amongst the myrtle trees, amongst the good smelling trees, the perfume trees, the pretty trees, praise the Lord, giving a report about the earth and how the earth is still, uh, even when Israel's on the foot. And that angered the Lord. No, they should not be still. They should not be at rest as if everything is right and this is the way it's supposed to be. This is not the way it's supposed to be. Have you not heard that Israel is the apple of my eye? And I'm not just talking about natural Israel. I'm talking about spiritual Israel as well. They, praise the Lord, who have demonstrated like Jacob, praise the Lord, that they are Israel. He who prevails, a prince who prevails with God and man. That's Israel. And that means that's the church and that's natural Israel. And that's the apple of my eye. And for the world to be at peace with keeping all of us underfoot angers the Lord. And the Lord, as the angel of the Lord, as the mediator speaking on our behalf to the father is seen sitting on a red horse. And that red depicts war. And at some point in time, praise the Lord, 
we are going to see the Lord coming as the son of David. He first came, praise the Lord, like the son of David. He first came like a Solomon, peaceful. But then he's coming warlike, like David. He's coming on a white horse. But by nature, praise the Lord, it's almost as if he's coming on a red horse, like the red and white speckled, praise the Lord. It's coming white because he's coming in, he's the, he's the prince of peace, but he is coming to wage war against his oppressors, against his aggressors, against his enemies, the red horse. So here, praise the Lord, the world may see him as one way, Oh, he's, he's great. He can't do this. No. You, you, you're missing the point. That God has no problem with putting underfoot his enemies. As a matter of fact, he can't wait for that to happen. He's waiting to put his enemies under his footstool. That is the objective. And that's when the son then submits unto the father in the end to complete the office of sonship. But he's in the process of putting his enemies under his footstool. His anger has not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. He can provide the means to get the curse off, but we have to be the ones to stretch our hands, to grab his hands, so that then he can surgically do what he needs to do to get the curse out of our house, so that we're no longer considered a den of thieves, but a house of prayer. Amen. We do thank the Lord for blessing us. Amen. With an opportunity to break the bread of life. Uh, praise the Lord. God is a good God. There's still so much more to discuss on this particular subject. There's a lot more to discuss. There's so many things. Praise the Lord. But what was discussed what was, was what was discussed. And we do thank the Lord for that uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, so before I turn the uh, service over to the hands of Elder Betts, praise the Lord, I'd like to invite anybody to have any questions uh, in Jesus' name or comments and questions in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Amen. Um, I'd like to then invite Elder Betts, praise the Lord, for closing uh, remarks in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord and good evening to all. Amen. Truly, protocol has been established, and we do thank God for our instructor this evening, Elder Bonet. Amen. The flying robe and unseen curse. Amen. I enjoyed what I've heard this evening. Amen. It seems like no matter where we go, <clears throat> we end up uh, addressing eschatology. And I think it's because the Lord is trying to send that clear message that we are in the last of the last days. Time is so short. And I think it's almost as if what the Lord said to Judas, that that thou doest, do quickly. It, it, it is time to make that decision where we're going to spend eternity. It is late in the evening. And so we thank God. And I truly agree. Um, with what Elder Bonet said, when the Lord gives us a word, we need to share the wealth. Somebody's soul is at stake. So when the Lord gives us a word to share, we have to give it the way the Lord gives it to us. Uh, one plants, another waters, but God gives the increase. You may think that that word you gave them didn't have effect. But down the road, you may shout with them in glory. <laughs> you just had no idea. So as the Lord give us that word, share the wealth. Let loose. Get what the Lord has given. God bless you, Elder Bonet. Thank you for this opportunity back in your hands. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. We thank you, Elder Betts. Amen. And we thank you all for joining us. Amen. Join us again uh, for our next encouragement series, which will actually take place um, on Thursday, the 30th, uh, we will have with us uh, uh, Elder Maurice Donovan, uh, praise the Lord, and uh, he will be the instructor for the evening. So we will be back in two weeks, uh, praise the Lord. So our next encouragement session is Thursday, March 30th, with uh, Elder Maurice Donovan, uh, in Jesus' name, amen. And without further ado, 
uh, let us go before the Lord and thank him for the opportunity that he has blessed us with this evening in Jesus name. Father God, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we love and thank you. We ask Lord that you would have mercy on us all. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to have come before you and pray that you will please with the fellowship. We ask that you will bless all of the participants on this call, Lord God, that you will bless the entirety of the church, that you will honor all the prayer requests, that you will look upon us, take our burdens, and replace them with a testimony that brings you glory. We pray that we're all rapture ready. We love and thank you for everything. Please keep us from the enemy. Just have us to grow in you, Jesus, and to know you and be your friend forever. Uh, Lord God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we do pray, amen and amen. Amen, everybody. Have a good evening. Amen. In Jesus' name. God bless you.